back to Deconstructing DJG. I am DJG and I am here with David and Cameron and we are in for the final section of James Dobson's The Strong-Willed Child. We have finally gotten into the teen years. Most of the actual disciplinary advice in this book is for children under 12. So, you know, Three quarters of this book is about children under 12. And then it has like the last chapter, maybe two chapters that actually deal with adolescence and early adulthood. He is talking about a teacher and he is speaking to the Senate in a hearing about children's development. Uh, His name is Bronfren... Brought- I believe he's like a researcher who they basically use a lot for this. He was basically saying that every phase of childhood is vital. During junior high was kind of the worst part because it is not unusual for happy, healthy children to enter junior high school, but then emerge two years later as broken, discouraged teenagers. And I can contest junior high is absolutely the worst i that whole like 11 to 13 or 14 they are freaking brutal it's it's quite something and i am honestly unsure like why that particular age is so bad i don't beginnings of hormones maybe there is the beginning of hormones but i feel like it's got to be more complicated than just are, are we talking hormones. in the context of the christian household or are we talking just in general i'm just saying in general because like, in the christian context it's because of hormones because that's, that's true that's true because that's the like, only thing that matters is your drive for sex but there is a, a researcher who basically they always trot out for homeschool stuff because this is getting like an ecological model. So maybe it's like an actual researcher who's like actually doing research. Yeah, see. Some to justify I, their bullshit. Which is basically like the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But like um, yes. more for like the individual's experience. How they how they experience society as opposed to like what they need from society. The very first time they hit the point where it's like you have some level of agency. And you have some level of like desire to use said agency. And the yeah. knowledge that you have said agency. And then also hormones. James Dobson was saying about this, uh, that junior high school students are typically brutal to one another, attacking and slashing a weak victim in much the same way a pack of northern wolves kill and devour a deformed caribou. We need to acknowledge that he just made an animal reference. Yes. It was a deformed caribou, too. Right? Few events stir my righteous indignation more than seeing a vulnerable child fresh from the hand of the creator in the morning of his life, being taught to hate himself and despise his physical body and wish he had never been born. This is from 1977, and they already are like, see those evil public schools? They're teaching you to hate your body and hate God and not this want to ironic. be born. I'm, I'm ironic, pretty sure though. that uh, there's other reasons why the kids Mr. are Dawson, upset and don't want to be born. Mr. Dawson, this is very ironic, doctor, though. babe, could you talk to me about what you've been talking Chill. about? Gay kids and gay people and how they're all just AIDS carriers and uh, should die? It's wild to me that there was so much of this so early. I I knew that, you know, my parents and and extended family and church families and stuff like that, I knew that they talked about it. I heard it on Rush Limbaugh, but I, I didn't think that I would see this stuff in the the IBLP books or the strong-willed child you know all of these these books for raising children from the 70s already have this bent about like making sure everyone appreciates and loves their god-given whatever I find it kind of funny where they say like things are are god-given and then it implies things aren't god-given yeah like it's like you had much of a choice in most of the stuff you have in the first place Funny that the language they have here is like literally the exact same language they're using now, but an exact opposite meaning. Where it's like, hey, they are literally teaching people to hate themselves and despise their well, bodies. And it's just like, well, what are you guys doing, another, guys? Well, there's another issue. Okay. The wolves are the active, the the strong, 
And the don't you also love being compared to a caribou? Isn't that great? You know, you know, deformed. Gonna, no, was, the, the bullies are strong, powerful wolves. The, and the victim is a deformed caribou who, in just the just a receptive. Uh, in, in the nature documentary, it is the natural course of events that they're going to be killed and eaten. The logic of his simile is that he thinks that the natural course of events is for the wolves to destroy the, the victim. Well, that's and that, that here's this natural thing that God designed, and I hate it. Right? And so then he proceeds to do the exact same thing that he hates. Yeah. Ironic. Does this mean, follow my logic... Okay. That he hates God's creation, or does it mean that he hates God, the creator of it, God's creation? It means creation? he hates himself for sin. As an evangelical, who he actually hates is Eve. Because yeah, she's the one who true. actually sinned, not God. Yep. So you can kind of say that, okay, he hates other people. I would still say he kind of hates himself in, the, in some level, because you can't not hate yourself. And then that's true. Yourself. Yeah, yeah, the self-loathing is always some level. there. The woman was dumb because she fell for it. And then she was conniving because she tempted and convinced Adam to sin. She said, hey, yo, here. And Adam's like, great. I'll eat it too. And they ate it. There was no actual yeah. tempting. Or was there, was there tempting? Wow. There might actually have been tempting. I don't think it's really spelled out. We're going to have to have a discussion about that at another time. James Dobson loves to talk himself up in his books, right? He says that when he was a teacher, he said, it became clear to me very early that I can impose all manner of discipline and strict behavioral requirements on my students, provided I treated each young person with genuine dignity and respect. I earned their friendship before and after school, during lunch, and through classroom encounters. I was tough, especially when challenged, but never discourteous, mean, or insulting. I defended the underdog and tenaciously tried to build each child's confidence and self-respect. However, I never compromised my standards of deportment. Students entered my classroom without talking each day. They did not chew gum or behave disrespectfully or curse or stab one another with a ballpoint pen. Uh, I was clearly the captain of the ship and I directed it with military zeal. It's, like, it's wild called? to me that he's like, I made sure to give these kids respect when the entire rest of this book has been all about not respecting the child. Well, it proves that he can go ahead and fake it in reality. Yeah. Yeah. The, okay. Assuming any of this is real. I'm going to take this paragraph as true. Okay. okay. He, he managed a classroom well. He could put on a face that was convincing a, a or, special type of gaslighting where a politician yeah if, if he did anything untoward with one of the children who would believe them because i could impose all manner of discipline and strict or behavioral requirements on my students that says a lot right there yeah right public face was is all of the respect but mm -hmm. the behavioral requirements he's created in this paragraph I'm what can basically be called structural gaslighting. I can totally believe there's like behind the scenes some shit going down. When he says I was tough, especially when challenged. Based on the story about that, his dog, I wonder what the hell he did. Exactly. Like we've seen what happens when dog dogs and small children challenge you. So what happens when a fellow teacher or a teenager or a parent challenges mm -hmm. you? Remember when he it wrestled his dog and then he compared yeah. children to dogs? Yeah. Well, no, the fact it was literally a physical fight with his dog. And he compared children to dogs. He's but, talking about how he has this great respect and, you know, gives people dignity. He then has a section about trying to improve communication with your I mean, I teenager. I agree with the tagline here. Verbalize complex, reestablish boundaries. It sounds Absolutely. To me. That totally sounds like... agree with the tagline. I love that. He's talking about how there's an irrationality with teenagers, and he compares that true. to mental patients. I mean, teenagers are irrational, <laughs> and I would I wouldn't say for the same reasons, but like for like they're just they just they don't have all the information, and they are ignorant, and yeah. they're just irrational at times. Correct. They're gonna do dumb shit. Correct. Uh, but at any I'm rate, he talks about a psychology intern working at a mental health facility, inpatient mental health facility, and there was a person who was completely disconnected from reality. They thought they were dead. 
And so the guy's like, aha, I got it. Do dead people bleed? And the person says, well, no, of course not. Dead people don't bleed. So then he pricks the guy's finger to show him that he bleeds. And so the delusional man says, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Apparently dead people can bleed. And so he's like, see, your teenagers could be irrational like that. And so sometimes it doesn't matter that you show them that they're incorrect. They're they're still going to be stuck in this delusion and irrationality. I would say he's entirely wrong, but mostly not for the reasons he's saying. Exactly. Because your your teenager is not going to know everything. Right. And it's not that they are disconnected from reality. They just don't know. You're never going to go ahead and convince a teenager in one conversation because there's no way you can go ahead and and believe that you would also to say everything you need to say to actually have them know enough. And sometimes. Exactly. They're going to reject what you're saying because it's you saying it. Yeah. It's just the, the whole like. Children are dogs. Children are hamsters. Children are mental patients. And yet, I am so good at treating people with dignity and respect. It's like, sir. So now we have another illustration of Brian, who is 14 and beginning to rebel. Bad Bad luck, luck, Brian. Brian. (laughs) If you're Brian's father... I would recommend that you invite him out to breakfast on a Saturday morning, leaving the rest of the family at home. It would be best if this event could occur during a relatively tranquil time, certainly not in the midst of a hassle or intergenerational battle. But you're supposed to do this because he's rebelling and you're in an intergenerational battle. So I'm not really sure how you're supposed to, like, separate from that. But whatever. You're supposed to he ignore says, everything and then just like say everything's fine. And no, you're saying it's just brunch, bro. Honestly, there's no 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 interrogations. Nothing exactly. to come up. We're just gonna well, have food. It's gonna be a great well, time. You're, you're supposed to admit that you have some important matters to discuss with him oh, that can't brother. be communicated adequately at home. But don't tip your hand before Saturday morning. Then at the appropriate moment during breakfast, convey the following messages or an adaptation thereof. But this is like James Dobson's 11-point plan to manipulate your so teenager. So Brian's 14, right? Yes, he's uh-huh. 14. Okay. It doesn't like being a 14-year-old. I don't even remember. It was not a good time. It, it was, was not. I was going through guilt spirals. I was going through guilt and shame spirals. So the only I, thing good oh, about 1995 was the music. So I was definitely in the whole like purity culture shame spiral at that point in time too. Yeah. Like it wasn't like all of that. Me as Brian's father, Brian, yes. I want yeah. to talk to you this morning because of the changes that are taking place in you and in our home. Not cool, bro. The past few weeks have not been very pleasant. You've been angry most of the time and you've become disobedient and rude. And your mother and I haven't done so well either. We've become irritable, irritable and we've said things we've regretted. Later. This is not what God wants us as parents or of you as our son. There has to be more creative way of solving our problems. That's why we're all here. Wait, what is this? This is part two. Oh, shit. There's more. I, I agree oh, there, it's, this is it. like 11 parts. So step two, as a place to begin, Brian, I want you to understand what is happening. You have gone into a new period of life known as adolescence. Ooh. This is the final phase of childhood, and it is often a very stormy and difficult few years. Nearly everyone on Earth goes through these rough years during their early teens, and you are right on schedule for this moment. Yeah. yeah. The, this is like incredibly invalidating as fuck. Like, this is just like, hey, all your problems, they're not a big deal. Dismiss, devalue. Now, always, I could see there's like like little chunks. It's like, yeah, that, that's like decent, but blasting the kid with facts is all you're doing. Yeah. It's like the kid knows the facts already. He knows that he's got problems. He knows everyone else already right. has problems problem is that you're not seeing the problems or that you are seeing the problems and then you're just like ignoring the problems info dumps never work especially in movies correct my, knows my therapist <laughs> has always said that you character. can't logic your way out of emotion many of the problems you face today were predictable from the day you were born simply because growing up has never been an easy thing to do there are even greater pressures on kids today than when we were young i've said that to tell you this we understand you and love you as much as we ever did even though in the past few months have been difficult in our home Pray harder, he's Brian. saying that <laughs> i brought you into this world so i could take you out of it cuz the people who don't experience this are the dead ones <laughs> Ryan, sorry, Ryan I'm, there's I'm, clearly sorry. something wrong between you and God, and you need to fix that right now. Right. <laughs> sorry. I'm, All right. So, part three. 
what is actually taking place, you see, is that you have had a taste of freedom. You are tired of being a little boy who is told what to wear and when to go to bed and what to eat. That is a healthy attitude, which will help you grow up. However, now you want to be your own boss and make your own decisions without interference from anyone. Brian, you will get what you want in a very short time. Why you is are 14 emphasized? now. Oh, I don't no, know why is... it's emphasized, but it's like a thirty. You really want You'll this, Brian? get what you want in a short no, no, time. No, 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 Brian, you will get what you want in a very short time. That's hey. all. Just say we're 14 now, and you'll soon you'll soon be 15 and 17 and 19. You will be grown in a twinkling of an eye. Evangelicals love that phrase. And we will no longer have any responsibility for That's you. That's not true. The day is coming when you will marry whomever you wish, go to whatever school you choose, select a profession or job that suits you. Your mother and I will not try to make those decisions for you. We will respect your adulthood. Furthermore, Brian, the closer you get to those days, the more freedom we plan to give you. I'm sorry. I call bullshit on all of that. The parents so who read like, this book are not the ones to actually stop inputting in their child's oh, life as soon as they're 18. No. Also, the fact no, that he's like, I won't have any responsibility is kind of funny. They're the ones who kick the kid out of 18 and then expect them to obey and then even after. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Which I guess so is the real responsibility. Like, I don't have to pay any money for you, but you got to pay me back for all that I've done for you, right. Brian. So I, this is the part no, where they we, bust out the uh, exorcism. And but unless you're charismatic, we don't really do exorcisms on the evangelical right. side. So, part four. But Brian, you must understand this message. You are not grown yet. During the past few weeks, you have wanted your mother and me to leave you alone, to let you stay out half the night if you chose, to fail in school, to carry no responsibility at home. And you have blown up whenever we have denied even your most extreme demands. The truth of the matter is you have wanted us to grant you 21-year-old freedom during the 14th year, although you still expect to have your shirts ironed and your meals fixed and your bills paid. You have Who wanted the best of both shirt. worlds. I don't know. I guess they ironed more stuff in the 70s. I'm assuming because like fabric softener and, and dryer sheets and stuff weren't as good back then. I don't know. So what are we to do? The easiest thing would be for us to let you have your way. There would be no hassles and no conflict and no more frustration. Many parents of 14-year-old sons and daughters have done just that. But we must not yield to this temptation. You are not ready for that complete independence. And we would be showing hatred for you instead of love if we surrendered at this time. We would regret our mistake for the rest of our lives and you would soon blame us too. And as you know, you have two younger sisters who are watching you very closely and must be protected from the things that you are teaching them. That last you know, bit's you, a little you, fucked That's up. dark. Go pray more, Brian. <laughs> 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 but this, this is, oh, this gets me so much though. You have so many parents, uh, the evangelical and not, alike that oh oh your kid is not quote unquote grateful or they're acting quote unquote entitled uh they have an attitude Gratitude. and so therefore you're supposed to remove all the nice things and be like see see i could be nice to you if you were nice is treating gratitude as a precondition to respect you basically you have to show gratitude before you're given anything to have gratitude for that is how the just an ordinary the relationship turns into basically the Lord vassal relationship. That's why gratitude is so emphasized. If you don't have gratitude, something's wrong with you. So it's right. like, or if they, better they, go they ahead and think... scare some gratitude up right now before you even get anything. And right. then maybe something we'll, you know, to worry about. I will or, say or the thing I find most interesting about this is just like the sheer extremes he's talking about here. Yeah. Where I feel like that's very like, I don't know if it's like a religious, I guess it's a religious thing where it's like, it is. either you have the way I'm telling you to do, it's either my way or the most extreme version of the other way yeah. that will lead to ruin. So well, it's like, yeah. there is very little discussion in between. If, if a patron, a, a client who received something from the patron, but then did not return what he was supposed to do, like 
write the poems that he was supposed to write or do the things that he was supposed to do for uh, in exchange that he was in a legal category of being an ingrate and i don't recall precisely what that did but it wrecked your legal status but that carried over into the lord vassal situation and this is an echo of that here of the child is being made into an ingrate by the way the he's actually literally like othering the child essentially saying you have all these things that you need to deal with and we are currently out of the graciousness of our hearts dealing with your problems Yep. As opposed to saying these are the family's problems because like you are part of the family and so we must deal with these problems. He's basically saying like we are dealing with your problems for you. Be thankful or else. Is right. essentially yeah. what he's was going for. We, do what we say as well because we're doing right. some good things. Because if you don't yeah. do that, then you are an ingrate. You lose status in the family, yeah. and we can justifiably then, right. We have the just the moral legal. It's imperative. Uh, the imperative. duty to essentially punish you for Correct. these things that are your problems that we are fixing for you, even right. though they're not your problems. Even anymore. though it's a situation that is between two people who both need to work on it, and there's a mutual settlement so, that could be found. You also got to look into the whole like the the imbalance of power too, where it's like the oh kid didn't God. really decide to have any of these problems in the first place, right? Or any of these responsibilities. So it's like you can't be saying that the kid's responsibility is in the first place because the parent's responsibility to provide all these things and right. nothing the, to do with the kid. Not having well developed enough communication skills and interpersonal which, skills which, and emotional um, regulation, which happen by having parents who are willing to spend the Teach effort. You. To teach you how to do this. Model it. They walk you through how those things go down and whatnot. Because the difference between saying to the kid when he's angry, stop being angry, and then like, and there's actually walking the kid through like, okay, what's actually going on? This is maddening. It's actually one of those things. One of my uh, uncles is actually doing the whole like emotional thing with his kids, and it's just the weirdest thing to hear them talk about it. It just feels (laughs) so just like wrong bizarre and like what are you even like, doing yeah exactly like i guess my perception of like what correct is is just like mm, that fucked up yes i i happened upon some parents on facebook nobody that i actually know just you know parents on facebook <laughs> giving advice to someone in a local forum she was having trouble connecting with her daughter emotionally she said And she also felt like her daughter was not grateful enough for things. And I would say probably a strong like 70% of the comments were, oh, well, you teach her to be grateful. Like show her how bad homeless people have it or take away all the non-necessities and like tell them how lucky they are to have a roof over their head. And I'm just like, oh, my Love God, it. no, Slay. she wants to emotionally connect with her daughter. And you're going to tell her to basically berate and threaten her. That's that's not building emotional <laughs> connection. What is wrong you're essentially with you? ostracizing. So if you don't suddenly feel these things, then I will punish you. Exactly. One of them was saying OP had commented about how it was really distressing how often her daughter would make comments about how she didn't choose to be here. And it was, you know, all her mom's fault. And somebody was actually in the comments below that saying, oh, she did try because only the bestest sperm wins its way into the egg. You can blame the father at that point for the specific child. (laughs) The child is still not making a conscious decision there. Like that's that's the dumbest thing ever. And yes. and new research coming out shows that actually the egg will secrete chemicals that attract certain uh, sperm. So it is the mother's fault. And repels other other sperm. Yeah. So so the egg actually does a, a bit of deciding in that. And I always love when these people who think they know biology so well and are just so confidently incorrect. Mm. It's just like these are the dumbest arguments. How is any of this supposed to help? What is wrong with you all? 
I feel like your problem was starting with the sentence on Facebook. I, I know, exactly. So- I try so hard to stay off of Facebook. I have kept my profile active strictly because it your- is a huge pain in the ass to delete it. And that would mean a whole bunch of my logins for other services would be messed up because it's linked to my Facebook account and there's no way to unlink it. All right, so part five. God has given us a responsibility as parents to do what is right for you, and he is holding us accountable for the way that we do that job. I want to read you an important passage from the Bible, which describes a father named Eli who did not discipline and correct his two unruly teenage sons. I love that in the 1970s, teenage teenager that was not one word it was a hyphenated word i thought it was just a bill gothard weird thing that he did but james dobson does the exact same fucking thing which is weird it is very weird he's going to compare it to eli and basically that like God's going to kill us if I don't discipline you effectively. This goes back and to the extremes and the evangelicals where they just exactly. like all they see is extremes. It's like, well, yes. I did literally nothing and got his sons killed. I either go ahead and literally install a, a authoritarianism regime where you can basically have zero freedom or I do nothing and you get killed. So it's exactly. like, why are those the options we're shown here? Well, I was talking to my my therapist on Monday and I was talking about how I I really struggle with needing choices and character traits and things like that. I need them to be quantifiable as good because I have been told implicitly or explicitly that the character traits, the choices, etc. are all quantifiably good. Bad and not just bad, but evil to the sense that it is going to cause me eternal punishment, right? You're and so I all then have the, traits? well, all the ones they disagree with, which is oh, a okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. whole well, bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. But I I have this this, you know, like like boomerang concept of like, well, I've been told I'm super bad evil, so I need to offset it. By, you know, doing all the most good and and ensuring that what I do is quantifiable as as good. And it's not really healthy because a whole lot of things that you do in life are completely neutral. And my my therapist was, you know, very gently uh, saying, you know, I can appreciate you needing to feel good after being, you know, called bad. But yeah. Wouldn't it be easier to just be neutral? And I like bust out crying. I was like, nope, that sounds way harder. I right. go of this like proof that I'm okay, that I'm not evil, that I'm not on my way to eternal damnation. You know, I I need that think, comfort in good. Yeah, I think the cause of that, though, is because like when it comes to religion, at least it's like good is viewed as perfection. And so I feel a lot of it's like they, they miscontextualize or they, they they don't know what good is. Yeah. Ooh. And everything that's not well, they, they call good perfection. Anything not good is evil. So it's like all they have is extremes. Yeah. Well and if, this is a difference in with Catholicism. In Catholicism, good is uh good enough, that'll that'll do. Uh, that'll do. <laughs> that's good See, enough. See, that's why we can't abide that's, you Catholics. You're just not good enough. Yeah, good enough to get into purgatory and anything else uh, is a bonus. A- anything else that needs to be fixed, will you'll deal with there. So good enough for government work is basically the Catholic way. Pretty yep. much. Yeah. So the, part well, six. Yep. Part F. I give this yeah, yeah, an exactly. F for failure. This brings us to the question of where we go from this moment. I want to make a pledge to you here and now. Your mother and I intend to be more sensitive to your needs and feelings than we've been in the past. Good. Uh, We're not perfect, as you well know. Biggest parent cop out ever. Go into extremes. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between abusing your child, doing the bare minimum, and, and perfect parent. Anyways. 
It is possible that you will feel we have been unfair at one time or another. Yes, if guaranteed. that occurs, you can express your views and we will listen to you. We oh, want God. to keep the door of communication standing wide open between us. When you seek a new privilege, I'm going to ask myself this question. Is there any way I can grant this request without harming Brian or other people? If I can permit what you want in good conscience, I will do so. I will compromise and bend as far as my best judgment will let me. Go back real quick. You use one part. Yes. So um, where it says, if, if you you can express your views and we will listen to you, you forgot to put the and judge you directly. Exactly. After. <laughs> will you that make this the oath? the biggest and, uh, lie ever. They want to keep the communication door open, but yes. they will judge you so hard that the kid closes Correct. it. Exactly. Will you make this oath in the mode of Genesis 24-2, where you swear on your manhood so you yes! violate it, it you'll be, you, uh, God will castrate you? Uh, I'm actually pretty certain that this person would probably go with it. They probably don't think God would ever castrate them. And the communication door thing, like, I, I this around, around purity culture and porn, like, there was a couple times where there was the conversation had, and the door is open, and communicate, and then the, the, the whole no, this, expression of views... And they will listen. They do listen. And then they will immediately judge you. And the kid will then close the door on the parents. And this is why at eight years old, when I started to figure out that I was gay, I knew better than to talk to any goddamn person. Because anyone in my life at that point would wow. report back to my parents. I knew that the response from my parents would not be good. Not good at all. Possibly a very physically unsafe situation and so i did not say a goddamn thing i knew better than to trust them with that information and then as an adult they were mad at me that i didn't come out until i was 30 because why wouldn't you come out to us earlier why did you lie to us for so long and then yeah. promptly like Nine months after telling me that, oh, yeah, you came out. That's great. You know, we'll never love you any differently, blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, by the way, you're dead to the family. You can no longer come to your sister's wedding. Like, you cannot contact us. We will never talk to you again. This is exactly why I waited until I was 30 to tell you because I am fair, physically okay. They did listen to you. They did listen to you. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Really, I don't know if they got the uh, door open. They didn't get the door of communication open, but like they listened. Yep. And then when I tried in uh, 2020 to open up to them again, because I, after many years of trying to patch up our relationship, I was like, okay, I'm really gonna try and be vulnerable. You know, I'm I'm in a really bad spot. I'm going to try leaning on them. And yeah, it it did not go well. Yep. At all. That sucks. They basically were like, I don't know why you're still doing therapy. It clearly isn't working. You know what? I actually sometimes think that myself to myself. It's like, why am I still doing this if nothing's fixed yet? At the same see, time, it's like, that is entirely your own brain not letting you see yes. what you've actually done yet. Correct. Like, I have Things have gotten better. You just can't fucking see it. And that, that honestly annoys me more than anything yep. else. Absolutely. Because I, I, I was feeling very stuck in therapy at that point. However... The thing that changed and that enabled me to like, stop plateauing is to acknowledge that what my parents have done to me is traumatic for me and that, you know, fostering a close relationship with them is not emotionally safe. It is not neurologically safe. I might be physically safe because they can't, you know, evict me from my house. They can't. What about prevent me from safe? eating food? Oh, definitely not spiritually safe. Definitely not spiritually safe. They're not safe what people if, for me. <clears throat> and so the more I'm trying to push this, like trying to rely on them as if they are a safe space, I, I, I was just hurting myself over and over and over again. What about electrically safe? You know, electrically safe, we're usually pretty good at. My dad and I did zap each other a couple of times while doing electronics projects at home. But usually uh, we were good about remembering the copper wire on our wrist. And, okay, and it was okay. it's, that's something, <laughs> it is something. It is definitely something. I was also, always vehicularly mechanically safe. Does that include forklifts as well? Because forklift safety is the most important kind of safety. 
I am a holy terror on a forklift. You do not that want me on a forklift. I, I learned that very quickly when I was working in a warehouse in my 20s. So he is willing to bend as far as his best judgment will let him. Um, I was about to, yeah. If I let him go out in the evenings to like, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to his friend's party, next thing you know, prostitutes. So uh, part seven, part G. Part. But hear this, G for Brian. God. It's G for gravitas. There will be a few matters that cannot be compromised. There will be occasions when I will have to say no. And when those times come, you can expect me to stand like the Rock of Gibraltar. No amount of violence or temper tantrums and door slammings will change a thing. In fact, if you choose to fight me in those remaining rules, then I promise that you will lose dramatically admittedly you're too big and grown up to spank but i can still make you uncomfortable and that will be my goal believe me brian i'll lie awake at nights figuring out how to make you miserable what kind of sadistic monster this feels a little bit like a really bad version of wonder woman it was a decent movie up until the very end yeah if you actually remove like 80 percent of what this guy's saying it's actually really decent Exactly. Move the end. It's like if you go back a little bit, the part where it's like, "Hey, I'll listen to you," and like all these different things, pay more attention. Like, oh, that stuff's good. But then you go to the point, like, if you don't, I will make your life a living hell. It's like, no, that's like literally exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve. Correct. Correct. He says, "I have the courage and determination to do my job during these last few years. You are at home, and I intend to use all of my resources for this purpose if necessary. So it's up to you." We could have a peaceful time of cooperation at home, or we could spend this last part of your childhood in unpleasantness and struggle. Either way, you will arrive home when you are told. You will carry your share of responsibility in the family, and you will continue to respect your mother and me. Thank you, sir. (laughs) May I have another? (laughs) This feels like, was he involved in the army at any point? Um, This this feels so much like army bullshit. So definitely he was not in the military. He was not from a military family. However, his mother was intolerant of sassiness and would strike her child with whatever object came to hand, including a shoe or a belt. She once gave him a massive blow with a girdle outfitted with straps and buckles. So we're seeing generational trauma right here. Yes. Yes. Huh. That explains a lot, actually. So part eight. Finally, Brian. Let me emphasize the message I gave you in the beginning. We love you more than you can imagine. We're going to remain friends during this difficult time, as long as you don't cross me. There is so much pain in the world today. Life involves disappointment and loss and rejection and aging and sickness and run on sentences and ultimately death. <laughs> you haven't felt much of that discomfort yet, but you'll taste Liar. it soon or else. So with yeah, all that is. heartache outside our door, let's not bring it, more of it on ourselves. We it need each inside other. The, it, it is inside the door, and you know it, and you are the cause of it. The call is coming from inside the house. Yep. We need you, and we and believe it or not, you still need us occasionally. And that, I suppose, is what we wanted to convey to you this morning. Let's make it better from now on. Yes. One of the things is, like, this chunk here, like, that's all he needed. Yeah. A lot so of this is so much well, simpler than he's making it, but he has to add all of this emotionally manipulative bullshit. But just be honest and like truly respectful. Well, I think he, he is being honest with all his emotional manipulative bullshit. In mm-hmm. that in sense, as I can tell, like if he wanted to actually convey what he says he wants to say, he doesn't need half the shit. But he doesn't want to convey what he says he wants to convey. Yeah. Duplicitous, yep. gaslighty bullshit. Exactly. Because this is a man who, at the time he wrote this, was still a licensed psychologist. He was an academic psychologist he got his doctorate from usc he was a pre- associate clinical professor of pediatrics at usc school of medicine i want to say it's very ironic because essentially, it is from what i can tell so this is essentially him externalizing his trauma not realizing it and then basically pretending that he's better than everyone else who does something Correct. Like, i find it ironic that he not he only is, is this you know pediatric psychologist basically he spent oh. 17 years on the staff of children's hospital of los angeles in the division of child development and medical genetics he worked for a while as an assistant to paul popino at the institute of family relations which was a marriage counseling center in los angeles uh popino as a eugenicist. 
Of course and he was. And he is uh, related to the Yahtzees. He was an influential advocate of the compulsory sterilization of the mentally ill. Yep. And the father of marriage counseling. Yep. That tells us so much about him. It really, really does. Uh, okay, how effective is marriage counseling? I imagine if it's done by people who actually care and aren't insane, maybe, but I don't know. I mean, it's like any other therapy. It's it's going to depend on how good is the clinician, how committed to doing the work in between sessions are the people involved in therapy. Are people, you know, acting in good faith in, in therapy with their partner? There's a lot of moving parts because it's not just you and your therapist. It's you, your therapist, and your partner uh, trying to work out things. And it can, it can be very dicey. But... It could absolutely be a really, really good thing. I I know a number of couples who have, for at least periods of time, seen a couples counselor, and they have all said that it was incredibly helpful. There are steps to be taken, but it's a very long, drawn-out process that requires a lot of consistency. And if you only think of the now and the immediate you reaction... You're all you're getting nowhere. You're- so here's another little window into the mind of James Dobson. When he was 16, said he began to play some games, which they viewed with alarm. I had not yet games. I don't know. It's the oh 1950s. God, is it Pokemon? Everyone knows Pokemon is demonic. It's Tamagotchi. I had not yet crossed the line into all out rebellion, but I was definitely leaning in that direction. Whatever the fuck that means. My father was a minister who was traveling consistently during that time. And when my mother informed him of my sudden defiance, he reacted decisively. He canceled his three-year speaking schedule and accepted a pastoral assignment, which permitted him to be home with me for my last two years of high school. He sold our home and moved the family 700 miles south to give me a fresh environment, new friends, and the opportunity to hunt and fish. I didn't know that I had motivated this relocation, but now I understand my parents' reasoning and appreciate they're caring enough to sacrifice their home, jobs, friends, and personal desires just for my welfare. So he wasn't actually an all-out rebellion. So he's not getting in trouble with the cops. He's not, like, telling Would them 1970s off. Would 1970s be, like, a about time when he was 16? Okay, hold no. on, hold on, hold on. He was no, he was sure. already a professional doctor in the nineteen seventies. So 1970s. it was, it was like, not Pokemon. So I don't it could know have what been the Beatles, be. I guess. I find it kind of crazy, like the the extreme measures they go, like oh he's playing games, let's move to hundred miles south. Right, it like okay. cancels a three year speaking engagement, <gasps> and like takes a a pay cut. Like I'm sorry, but I feel like there was other stuff going on, and they have just blamed it on James and like oh we did this for you. That's some seriously internalized drama right there. Can you imagine being like, oh, I was playing games and now my parents have sacrificed literally everything just so I don't play those games? Like, damn. Well, and also at 16 years old, to suddenly be uprooted from everything that you have ever known and in a totally new place with new people, et cetera, like that is so destabilizing in the middle of a tumultuous time. That's not how you make things better. I still want to know what games, because like, I can't think of a single game that like evangelicals would hate that would have been out that time. No, 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 no. He means games. It's it's in quotations. So he doesn't mean like actual physical games. Oh, okay. He's talking about you know he was he was getting into trouble, but not actually getting into trouble. Uh, I'm imagining going on dates with a black girl. That would track. All right, so then James stops and goes into a section where he basically pulls a Bethany Beal. And he's like, hey, so for this issue, I've created this book that you can buy and this tape series you can buy and this conference that you can go to and this devotional that you can read and like all these other services and and stuff that he could sell you to fix this problem that he's creating in this book. So he has one about uh, for, for teenagers to listen to. Right. It's six tapes. The first one is the Canyon of Inferiority. This tape That's discusses my- widespread <laughs> feelings of inferiority <laughs> among <laughs> adolescents and why this low self-esteem <laughs> occurs. It also suggests how to overcome <laughs> a lack of confidence. Older teenagers should hear this tape as well. 
Number two is conformity in adolescence. This second tape reveals the enormous peer pressure experienced during the teenage years. The dangers of group pressure, including drug abuse and alcoholism, are discussed. But you're supposed to conform to Christ. And he's usually correct about what it is, and then he goes off in his this like rant of like what it means and how to fix it. This is a giraffe, thus we must feed it birdseed. How it's how did you get from giraffe. A to B? That doesn't exactly. make any goddamn sense. You missed like 602 <laughs> letters between them. and then... We went through it to a different uh, alphabet entirely. So tape three is an explanation of puberty, which is an in-depth presentation of the physical changes, which often frighten the uninformed child. He's not So wrong. that is very true. I'm kind of curious how in-depth. I mean, it's from James Dobson, so... I mean, it's from James Dobson. He still was a, a, a child psychologist, so, like, he should know the He's physical changes. He's a psychologist. Changes. That's oh, sure. mental He should know the physical changes. changes. I'm still kind of curious what the tape three would be like, because I got very little of that in my explanation of the bridge oh, and the I, was... I found my passport to purity the <gasps> other day. Oh, my God. Like, Holy shit. I was going to maintain my moral purity, but I, I fucked that up. <laughs> I cussed too much. Uh, so on tape three, he goes over sexual development, which includes explanation of menstruation, nocturnal emissions, masturbation, size of breasts and reproductive organs, and This is all cetera. done confidently and openly. Yes. Oh. But but why are we talking about not. the size of breasts? Being shared what's like saying like, hey, just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. That's my, my only I assumption. Suppose. He says this understanding can prevent years of suffering and unnecessary worry if presented at the proper time. He's not wrong. True. In, in, Information in is wonderful. That's why kids should have comprehensive sex education that goes beyond this bullshit and actually talks about things like how to have healthy but romantic if relationships you tell them how, how to, to have, have it, consent if you tell them how to do that they're going to go out and get teen pregnancies and it's going to ruin the world entirely i know yeah exactly and then brian's have to pray a lot more to solve all of it <laughs> brian's tape just going to be stuck in prayer for the rest of his life uh-huh mm, so more, tape Brian. four is the meaning of love and it clarifies the 10 most common misconceptions about romantic love. I really the like adults this. will enjoy this as well. I, I think I would actually enjoy reading this. You'd be like, what the heck? What bullshit is this? I want to know what this is now. Tape Wait. five is the search for identity. Talks about other emotions that frequently accompany adolescence. I'm really not sure what exactly he, he means by identity here. Like... It, it um, could go many, many, many ways, and I'm quite certain none of them are good. Well, he's obviously talking about how you need to discover your queer identity and how to integrate with your Christian identity, obviously. Correct. Oh. So take six is the rap session. This final tape is perhaps the most interesting presentation in the album. Four teenagers gathered for a rap session in my home, discussing their early experiences as an adolescent. Their previous fears, embarrassments, and anxieties are exposed in an open and lively interaction. So four poor kids from their... I can just imagine... Got Four white sucked breads. into his house. Doing their best to rap. <laughs> and there is a um, a audio CD on Amazon that you can buy. And has the most depressing reviews. They really like the discs. And it makes me kind of sad. How... Apparently people still read The strong Willed Child. Oh yeah, absolutely. Which is, that, that's probably the most depressing thing to me. Correct. There, there are people who are currently parents. Who have had this book recommended to them. Uh, family members, church family have uh, like offered the book to them. He's like, oh, I didn't want this section to sound like an advertisement, but I suppose that's what it is. So then he talks about the graduating class of 1965 and what a shit show they were and how their parents completely failed them because they got into LSD and promiscuity and they were divorced and, and all this stuff, right? Like it's the fucking end of the world. But then you have these quotes 
from these adults who graduated in 1965, they basically all explain that my parents paid for everything in my life and I never had to work for anything. And so therefore it was really hard for me to transition to being out of the house and like taking care of myself because I just expected my parents to keep paying for everything and I would never have to work. And it's like, okay, that is is not even close to like the issue because that is it, it is a a specifically waspy kind of uh, experience. Anybody who is not upper middle class, they're not going to have that experience. He said, uh, because I could rely on my parents to give me concrete financial support, I early on developed an aversion to working in a structured situation where I had to be someplace at a certain time. Somebody else said, uh, for six months, it was cool, referring to drug abuse. There was no thievery or crashing cars or falling downstairs. But after that, I was really hooked. I crashed my parents' Peugeot, a nice car. No one was hurt in the accident. I remember bouncing around the inside of the car as it rolled over. I also remember finding myself out on the street before the police came and remembering that I had a marijuana joint in my pocket. And so not wanting to get busted for possession, I threw the joint away and did not get busted, but I could not walk a straight line at the police station. They put me in a tank overnight. My father came down and he was so exasperated and horrified at what I had become that he said uh, through the jail grill that I could just stay there. This was quite a blow to me because they had always rescued me in the past. So, I mean, this this is that extreme that you were talking about. You know, there's either I'm going to give you this massive authoritarian fascist control at home. So that way you turn out good, because if I do anything else, you're going to be drug addicted, falling down on the street and well, and you're going to end up in jail. It's more the fact that they, they can't see anything between those two things. Either they do authoritarianism or they do nothing. And like they see nothing between those. That's really what, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's so what I'm weird. saying. They will do what they do until 18 and bam, then you're an adult. And then yep, you're expected right. to do adult things. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not going to teach you about what you need, what your expectations are as an adult. We're not going to give you the tools to be to adult. But we're going to kick you out of the house and say, hey, you're all, we have you're, no further responsibility for you. Right. For two reasons, it was certain that many members of the class of 65 would become parasites living off their parents or the taxpayers. Uh, First, their parents voice. prevented the children from understanding the survival by always solving their problems for them. By age 18, a man or woman's character is largely set. If up to this age, the parents have freely provided cars, tuition, allowances, vacations, clothes, apartments, and entertainment, then they should be too surprised when they turn out their son or daughter is a moral cripple. Now, I'm sorry, but at 18, yes, your parents should be providing food, shelter, transportation, Clothing, like, yes, that that is the bare minimum. That is what you as a parent are legally required to provide until they are 18 years old or legally emancipated. That's not going to turn them into a moral cripple. If you don't, as a parent, then you're the moral cripple. That's correct. I find it hilarious they call it freely. All they have is extremes here. Yeah. What is the payment he expects parents to extract from the children? Gratitude. Respect, gratitude. No, there's, 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 I'm thinking so, of uh, something else beyond gratitude. Groveling? There's a logic to uh, payment that enables abuse. Because they haven't paid you, it essentially is like, okay, I can now basically do whatever I want with this child because they have not paid me yes. back what I've done for them. He wraps up the book by talking about freedom. He says that love demands freedom and that in the example of love that God demonstrates for us it is a free choice to choose salvation it is a a freely offered love and mercy that you get this salvation and so we should 
see child rearing in the same way that you know they they are given freedom because we love them and so we give the children the opportunity to make the wrong decision but because this is the evangelical world both with god and with parents this is all backed up with that huge thing that i was just talking about earlier in therapy where it's you know i'm not just wrong i'm not just bad i am evil and i am destined for eternal damnation eternal conscious torment and the only option to get you out of that is salvation it is respect it is obedience and without that you will die a thousand deaths for the rest of eternity evangelicals hate catholics because catholics be like "Eh, sorry and then be fine you're fine you're gonna end up in purgatory don't even worry about it Everyone's there anyway. I was expecting so much more from this book, and it's just, it sucks. He he says that basically once they become adults, our training has been completed, and the moment of release has arrived. As I did with the young coyote, <laughs> we must unsnap the leash and remove the collar. Wait, when did he get a coyote? He Early participated story. in, like, this releasing of coyotes back into the wild when he was in college or some shit. Um, Moment of release? That sounds filthy. It does! He uh, does not understand how he sounds. But okay. um, children so are, are <laughs> dogs. They are hamsters. They are mental patients that are disconnected from reality. They and they are reindeer. coyotes. They're, they're deformed caribou. He cannot stop comparing children to wild animals. You could make the comparison at times, but the way he compares it is immediately the most brutal aspects of nature possible. Exactly. Which I find funny. Like, literally him fighting a dog. Horrifying. I'm just like, bro, what the hell are you doing? Correct. But he says, if our child runs, he runs. If he marries the wrong person, he marries the wrong person. If he takes drugs, he takes drugs. If he goes to the wrong school or rejects his faith, or refuses to work, or squanders his inheritance on liquor and prostitutes, then he must be permitted to make these destructive choices. But it is not our task to pay the bills, ameliorate the consequences, or support his folly. And that, my friends, is why my parents guilt-tripped me about needing some help paying off vet bills, because clearly it was my my bad life choices that I had made as an adult that meant I was in debt because I paid for a lot of end-of-life care for my dog. I'm really not sure how they got from A to B on that one. They they ended up in the oop salon. <laughs> It's uh, it's a it prosperity gamble. gospel where it's like because, because you're not successful, clearly God hates you. It's all because I left the church. They think that I'm gay because I left the church. They think That's that I am divorced because I left the church. That they think true. that I have mental health issues because I left the church. Like all of this stems to this this life choice of of leaving the church. And it's like, no. Essentially, they do view it as the cause because essentially it is where it's like you mm-hmm. didn't ever come out as gay in the church because that'd be the stupidest thing you could do. <laughs> so when you leave the church, so essentially they, they essentially view that and because they don't want to actually assign the church as the cause. They want to yeah. assign the lack of the church as the cause. Correct. Because but at it the makes same no time, sense to them. It's because yep. they left. It has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, it's morally neutral to be queer, trans, non-binary. That must be a bad thing because the church they, says it's bad. They might say that, oh, p- the people in the church hurt you, not the church. Which mm-hmm. is bullshit because the, the people in the church are the church. The If you're going to say that, oh, the, unless it was the institution, the pastor himself then if the church didn't hurt you. There's this weird like distinction between people and church where it's like there is yes. the church, which is like a, a metaphysical conglomeration, and then there's people who are part of the church, but it's like the Trinity, where they're all three the same thing. They're also all different things at the same time. That's how the evangelicals view church. They will constantly talk about how the church is not a building. The church is not a denomination. It is the people of God. It is brothers and sisters in Christ. That is the church. But then as soon as you say, I was hurt by the church, and you're talking about both the people people. within and And the structures 
of the church, the patriarchy, but the misogyny, the, the but it's all boils down to the people. And so they will say that, you know, the church is the people. Then if you are hurt by the church, then suddenly everybody is now individual people. And there is no, like, group think, there is no culture, there is no overarching structures of yeah, it's, patriarchy, it's one misogyny. Bad it's, it's not because there's a, a, a systemic, like, essentially corruption to all of it that results in people being damaged by it. It's that, oh, that one guy did that one thing that yeah. one time, and that's why you hate God. And it's an unreasonable Correct. thing. It's, yes. like Jerry. So... In in his final pages, he says that, you know, nothing that I have written is my own unsupported recommendations, similar to other parenting and child development experts that I have shit on throughout the course of this book, saying that, oh, well, that's just their opinion. It's like your opinion, man. The underlying principles expressed herein are not my own innovative insights, which would be forgotten in a brief season or two. Instead, they originated with the inspired biblical writers who gave us the foundation for all relationships in the home. As such, these principles have been handed down generation after generation to this very day. Our ancestors taught it to their children, who taught it to their children, keeping the knowledge alive for posterity. If that was the case, then why the fuck does he have to write a book about it? So, yeah, this this has basically been um, an exercise in just propagating generational trauma over and over and over again. And not just calling it, like, the most effective way to parent. No, this is the most godly way to parent. This is the only godly way to parent. This is the only will- way that you're not going to end up with drug-addicted children sleeping on the street. But that is not how to parent in a healthy way in modern society. Not finding individuation from the parents or from the, the family of origin or whatever. That That is very much what they want. My parents did not want me to become a a <clears throat> autonomous individual that was different from them. Business, exactly. They wanted me to continue doing the things that the people in my family have been doing for generations. Yeah. Evangelicals don't want progress in society. They want everything to remain the same as it has since 1830. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap us up there. This has been the third and final installment in reading through James Dobson's The strong Willed Child. I definitely want to read some more James Dobson. I want to dig a little bit more into that because as as fascinating as the IBLP Bill Gothard stuff was, the, the James Dobson just just hits a lot closer to home. Mm-hmm.